sometimes the reason that it doesn't get documented is because it really genuinely is not clear. Um, and it may be that people are going to recover. And if there's, I think if there's a reasonable chance that, they, that this can be reversed, then the prognosis actually is improved. So, and it does take time to establish the prognosis sometimes. Uh, so I, want to be, I just want to be careful that we appreciate sometimes the complexity that's involved in that. Um, but the, what, what I'm referring to is when the prognosis is fairly clear, um, and the, you know, for example, after a patient's been in the ICU for a month, in most cases, I think the prognosis will be more clear. But if they're just being brought in, you know, on their second day of assessment, then, you know, whether treatment and treatment just begun, then it's not, the prognosis still is not clear. So if the prognosis isn't clear, then, I mean, all bets are off on this. Okay, so that, I mean, that assumption, I think, is we need to be clear about. Um, and then what we mean by futility is not that it doesn't work, because treatments that are physiologically futile, that is obvious. There's no, I mean, there's no discussion about that. We're referring to are treatments that don't bring a, a benefit to the patient. Now, what, what I mean by Futile, though, in a little bit broader sense, is that a treatment that's futile is not going to reverse an irreversible downward spiral toward death. Okay. Now, the tricky part of this, and this is where I've had we've had numerous debates with physicians about this, is whether to treat reversible conditions that are part of a general irreversible downward spiral. So for example, the person who has terminal lung cancer, there's a huge debate about whether to treat the pneumonia that they get. Right? Now some physicians are adamant that if they can reverse a, a disease, you're obligated to treat it. Others, I think, ask the question, we're treating this to, to what end, specifically? And if the end, I mean, you always treat things if the end is the patient's comfort. Now, you always treat that. Right? But it's not, I think some of the physicians raise the question, it's not as clear what the end of treating the pneumonia is if the patient will die imminently of lung cancer. Uh, now, if treating that is necessary for their comfort, then that's different. Okay, so we, I, we need to be, I think, a little bit Careful. I think you can. I think it. I think there are times when physicians are not obligated to reverse, rever, to treat reversible conditions, because it, it seems to me that in you know that in, at least in some cases, that dying of lung cancer would be more burdensome than dying of pneumonia. And see, I think it's okay to ask our, to frame the question a little bit differently at the end of life. Typically we ask the question, is this going to be the disease or event that kills our loved one? It, we ask it more descriptively. I think it's okay to ask the question, is this the disease or episode that we will allow to be the cause of death for our loved one? If the prog again, if the general overall prognosis is very poor, I think that's acceptable to ask that question. And I don't think that every reversible condition need always be reversed. Okay. You want to raise a question on that, Doc? You, you want to raise a question on that? Okay. brings to mind for me a similar situation with a, an elderly friend of mine who was receiving uh, chemo 
mild chemotherapy, but still chemotherapy, whose doctor and family decided that it would be beneficial for her to receive a hip replacement. At the time that they decided that, I thought she would never get out of bed again. She will never recover. And she didn't. And I still wonder about the ethics of that on the doctor's part as well as the family's part. Why would they do that to her? See, here's the, she was in yeah. some pain, but not yeah. as much as she was after that surgery. I think if, if the intention is to, to control pain, then I think that's, you know, that's okay to attempt that. But I think in general, what we want to encourage the families, and this is what we ended up asking of the physicians also, is that given the prognosis, then we, we ask now, what, what is the, what's the goal for this treatment? Okay. And getting the family sometimes to recognize the, that the goal of the treatment may be a somewhat limited objective. I mean, we've had families who, you know, who think that their terminally ill loved ones are going to walk out of the hospital on their own power. And they're not going to do that. But ensuring that the goal and the plan of care are consistent with the prognosis is, I think is a really helpful exercise for the family to wrestle with and as a point of discussion with the physician. I think these are questions that are very appropriate for family members to ask. You know, what's the prognosis? What is the goal? For this care, and I think the, I think for the physician, it's a good it's 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 good to have the family be able to articulate what their goal or their expected goal for the treatment is also, because that's I think sometimes where m miscommunication of expectations sometimes takes place. Um, did that answer your question? All right. Now let's let's think about now. Just so we're all clear on this, what what treatments constitute life support? Ventilation. Ventilator support. Okay. All feeding, feeding tube. Uh, some debate about that, but generally, yes. Okay. What else? <coughs> CPR, generally a life-sustaining treatment. Dialysis is often considered a life-sustaining treatment. Okay. There's, uh, I'd say there's what generally included as a life support would also be various drugs that keep your blood pressure at the right place. Um, Technically, you could probably say that any treatment without which a patient will imminently die could be considered a life support or a life sustaining treatment. But generally, we don't consider you know, antibiotics for pneumonia at the end of life to be a life support. Um, though, technically, you could probably call it that under certain narrow circumstances. Okay. Now, specifically, the decisions to remove or withdraw, or withdraw or withhold, okay, and I would suggest that withholding and withdrawing morally are the same thing, but emotionally, they're really different. Right? Now, other than maybe an exception for dialysis, where sometimes it's, I mean, it's, it's hard for patients to make decisions to start dialysis. But generally, emotionally, it's a lot easier to begin a treatment than it is to remove it or withdraw it once it's been begun. So, but morally, we'll treat these the same. Now, is this playing God? 
because sometimes what happens is you'll remove, you know, all the family will authorize ventilator support removed, and the patient will die within a relatively short period of time after that support's removed. And the family not only feels like they've killed their loved one, but that they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. That sometimes they articulate with that term playing God. What, what do we say to that? Isn't there a sense in which God has already been playing when, in a sense, you know, death has occurred, the death process has begun, so in essence we're just not stopping the death process anymore. We're removing life support that was allowing the death process to continue, okay. in which that ends up when the patient okay. So we're not playing God. God's already mm -hmm. done his thing. If you, to what degree you want to say God has been involved, but um, if they've had a, a stroke, or, you know, and it's a, a major stroke and they're dying and life support's been instituted such that it stops the death process, well, you know, death has already occurred, we just stopped it, you know. You know and so not, not, I wouldn't say not, exa not exactly. Um, the, the event that will lead to their death has begun. I think that's probably right that in, in some cases we are merely prolonging an inevitable dying process. And so by removing life support, we are allowing death to take its natural, normal course. Okay? So th I think there is a difference between killing someone and allowing them to die. That's a morally relevant distinction. Um, now, the term playing God you know, it depends on what you mean by that. I mean, what exactly, you know, I mean, we, we use that term to cover a lot of ground for things that we just generally either don't like or don't feel like we should be doing. Okay? But what do we mean by that term, specifically? Um, this kind of thing, I, I agree with just about what Alan was saying, but I think maybe in terms of playing God in the sense that um, there's sort of a refusal to, um, I guess kind of the refusal of, hey, this person's in an irreversible state. Yeah, I think it, there's a time where we just need to sort of pull the plug, for lack of better words. But I think somebody refusing to, you know, plays God in the sense that, hey, we don't, I don't want this person to die when I, until I say so. So, okay, so it's a control thing. Yeah, sort of okay. a control thing. So. All right. I think generally, the way we ought to think about the term and it's, it's related to that. I think generally what we mean by that is that we are, when we play God, we are usurping a prerogative that belongs to God alone. Yeah. Which I would suggest is that the taking of innocent life is playing God. And I think that assist, uh, assisted suicide is complicity in playing God and euthanasia is directly that. But it's not as clear, it seems to me, that removing life support is playing God because allowing death to take its natural course is not something that, under the right conditions, we would say is morally problematic. Okay? So it, sort of, it, it depends a little bit on how you answer this second one. If removing life support is killing your loved one, then it is indeed playing God. But, I mean, Alan, I think you're right that removing life support is allowing the process to run on without any obstacles from medicine any further. So that somebody who decides, who makes a very tough decision to go off dialysis is essentially allowing kidney failure to take its natural course. Okay or somebody who wants ventilator support removed, is allowing lung disease, or whatever it might be, to take its natural course. Okay? Now with feeding tubes, it's a little bit, it's not quite as clear, because the, the feeding tubes are, for one, there's some debate over whether they're a form of treatment or not. I mean, I, I, I tend to think that they are, uh, because they, they require a surgeon 
to insert in most cases in a licensed facility. Uh, and it's the, the med, sort of medically provided food and water is very different than sort of the traditional, you know, cup of water for the dying. Um, but when feeding tubes are removed, generally what the patient dies of is dehydration, okay, which is a little bit different than, you know, when dialysis is removed, it's real clear that it's the kidney failure that is the, at least the proximate cause of death. Um, but with feeding tubes, I think you can still make the case that it's the underlying disease, the underlying disease or condition, condition may, may be a head injury from an accident or something like that, but it's the underlying disease or condition that rendered this person unable to take nutrients by mouth and swallow that is the ultimate cause of that person's death. Because prior to the, prior to the time when we had feeding tubes, if that person had a stroke and lost the ability to swallow, our options for feeding that person were pretty limited. So the, the, I admit it's a, it's a little bit different. What exactly causes the patient's death, I think, takes a little bit more discussion. Uh, but I would tend to see feeding tubes as a form of treatment. And I don't think that feeding tubes are starving someone to death any more than removing ventilator support constitutes suffocating someone to death. It's, I think there's still, there's a natural there's, a, there's a, a disease process that's unfolding that we have chosen not to interrupt any further. Okay? Now, of course, not every circumstance where we allow people to die, of course, is morally justifiable. Again, we're in the general context of the prognosis being bleak and clear. and treatments either being futile or more burdensome and beneficial in those cases. Right, does that make sense? Okay. Um, this is, I, I think, th this is the issue, unfortunately, that got obscured with Terry Schiavo's case. And unfortunately, there were so many other dysfunctional things going on behind the scenes uh, and legitimate questions, I think, were raised about how it was that the perception of her wishes changed. Because she'd been on feeding tubes for 12 years under the assumption that her husband was representing her wishes on that. And then he obviously wanted to get on with his life and then somehow her wishes change, or the perception of her wishes changed. Now, see, if she'd have written down her wishes, none of this would ever seem the light of day in a courtroom. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, the principle got obscured. I think if that, if that had been her wish clearly expressed, I think it would have been okay to have those feeding tubes removed. Since her wishes were not clear, and this is where her husband claimed that they had conversations about this and her wishes were clear, but if that's true, I just, I wonder, how do you account for the first 12 years and then for the change? And I think it's, it's unlikely that at, at, her, at her age, I mean, she was 27, when she lapsed into a vegetative state or something close to it. And I think the, the notion that at 27 <clears throat> you've had that kind of serious conversation with your spouse or loved one is not, it's not impossible, but I think is unlikely. And, but it, it makes it hard to account for the, the change that was made. I think probably what should have been done was he should have turned her care over to her parents who were more than willing to, to assume that responsibility and allow him to get on with his life like he wanted to. Unfortunately, what 
got obscured was the, the principle of you know, feeding tubes being medical treatment. Uh, and I was, I was on I was debating this with a, 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 it was a, I forget, it was a scientist and a rabbi. And the, the rabbi closed our discussion with saying that feeding tubes are as basic as a fork and a knife. And then they should never be removed. And the Pope actually at the time came out with a statement that feeding tubes should never be removed. Uh, and I think, I think both, both of those I, I think are incorrect. Uh, I think under the right conditions, you know, feeding tubes are not intrinsically the same thing as a fork and a knife. Um, and I think there are times when they can be removed under the same conditions. And this is one of, the, one of the big things that you can clarify in an advanced directive, is if you are in something like a vegetative state or a severe dementia, you often get this at the end of Alzheimer's, uh, where people lose their ability to swallow. Um, you can elect to have feeding tubes removed when you get to that point. Uh, and I don't, I, my, my own view is I don't think there's anything wrong with that, though I'll, I'll acknowledge that there is some debate in the, you know, in the more of the pro-life community, on that. So, yes. I'm just wondering if there's a problem with saying that feeding tube is medical technology because, I'm just, if I recall, there were instances when I worked at the hospital at LA County. There was times when people didn't require a feeding tube; they could just be fed by a <coughs> family member giving them food or the nurse giving them food by a spoon or whatever. But then later, as a convenience to the family or to the to the medical staff, a feeding tube was placed. So now a feeding tube is used to ensure that basic care is being provided. But it was almost like um, in order uh, now that the feeding tube is in there, it's now considered a medical treatment that can be removed. And so what was once a convenience to the family and to the to the medical staff has now become a medical treatment that can be removed so now we can kill the patient. But had they never installed a feeding tube they would still be being fed by mouth, and nobody would have the right to say, we can withdraw the food. See, then I think it's, it's less clear what the underlying disease or condition is that would be the, the ultimate cause of that patient's death. Um, so I think that, that may be a little bit different. Uh, and I, it seems to me if a, in, in, in most, not all, I mean, in some cases, at the end of life, you know, you, I mean, the body starts to shut down and you lose, I mean, some patients at the end of life actually have lost the ability to process nutrients. I think feeding those patients, I think, would be unethical. Uh, right, because, then it's, then it's right. Futile. Right, and then I think it's, I think you're actually increasing the net level of suffering for the person, too. Um, I think if, if the person can be fed by mouth and desires to be fed by mouth, then even if feeding tubes are removed, I still think there's an obligation to attempt to feed them by mouth. Now, some people at the end, at the end of life, though, they, they, I mean, they lose their appetite, they lose their desire to eat. I mean, my dad ate virtually nothing at the end of his life. And I think that would have been unjust to try to force feed him. Um, but I think that to, 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 the way I nuance that a little bit differently is that the underlying disease or condition that is the, the cause of death at the end of the day is less clear in those cases where the patient has not lost the ability to take in food and water by mouth. Okay, now, what about the notion, you know, you say, how, how can you people say that stopping treatments is okay? I thought you believed in the sanctity of life. I thought you believed that all life was sacred. Don't you believe that anymore? What would you say? Yes. Letting go actually carry the course eventually to death is actually 
that is within the realm of the saints respecting like, in the course of it. Um, because I mean, every life has to come to an end. And so coming to the end in the most dignified way is, is sanctifying what that life is. noteworthy difference between ending a life and allowing a life to end. Which, you know, it sounds like a sort of the obvious because that's really what you're speaking of, but I think that that distinction is, is a key one. All right. It, you know, probably not as much anymore, but it, it used to be that there was a lot of opposition to removing any life support as being inconsistent with the sanctity of life. I think one thing to be careful about is that we, we be care I think we should be careful not to make a theological statement that we don't want to make. Because if, if it's true that we're obligated to keep everyone alive at all times at all costs, and it seems to me we're making a theological statement that we ought not to make. And that is, the statement we were making is that earthly life is the highest good. Which smacks a little bit of idolatry. Okay? Right? But theologically we know that, that that's not true. Right? Earthly life is not the highest good. Right? Like Augustine or Augustine got it right when he said our highest good is what? You've read Augustine on this. Our highest good is what? Yeah, it's our eternal fellowship with God. That's what you were thinking. Uh, okay. So we would say, I think we say earthly life is a penultimate good, but not the ultimate good. So that I would say that you know, to equate the sanctity of life with vitalism is a misreading of the, of the sanctity of life. And you are sort of substituting the sanctity of life with idolatry. Uh, okay. Now, uh, what about keeping treatments going because God works miracles? And no, no doubt there have been, there are anecdotal cases where the recovery has absolutely confounded the physicians involved. Right? You had any of those? Yeah, I actually have a pastor who refuses to stop asking because he feels God will come. Yeah. And I tell him, God will come with technology to use it. And you can create miracles that could be even after you start the house. So now what happened to him? He, he hasn't come back to see me. <laughs> okay. So you, have to, he has, you don't know if he's died? No, he, I don't think he is. He still has some time. I see. We'll just I see. Okay. I, su I suspect there are some, there are some cases where, you know, where pe people wake up after being in comas for many years. Uh, I'm not sure if, I'm sure how frequently kidney failure reverses itself without a transplant, but, yeah. The other thing I see is sometimes patients who's been on respirators <coughs> have been unresponsive, but then the family who's there at the same time and they see a response, mm -hmm. that, you know, the nurses and the rest of us don't see. But they, they have different perceptions. Right. Yeah, so, but that's, that would be a little different than somebody you know, wake, waking up and becoming plainly responsive. Yeah, I'm just saying that. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. right. See, I, I don't, I've, I've, been, I've been tempted. I'd never do this because they, you probably get thrown out. You might be able. You might be able to get by with this. Uh, although, you know, probably suggesting that God gave us technology to treat disease is probably a, 
overall a better response. But sometimes I think if you can't get through to families on this, I, I think social workers actually like this suggestion, but I, I, I probably would never say it, just, but just between us. It's tempting to say to families, well, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna wait for a miracle, let's really go for it, right? And turn off everything. And let's go for broke on this. And, you know, because last time I checked, though God gave us technology, God does not need technology to work miracles. I take it what most families want, though, are medically assisted miracles. <laughs> and I think, I think actually this is a really unproductive road of discussion to take because with a Christian family, what I would suggest is that the, the miracle, the real miracle is going to take place on the other side of eternity when your loved one will be healed not only of this disease but all the other ones that are afflicting the person. I mean, I told my dad that, you know, it's not just your cancer that's going to be dealt with. It's all the other things that are plaguing you too. That's the miracle. And so in most cases, that miracle occurs on the other side of eternity, but it's no less miraculous and no less significant because of when it occurs. And that's why I think the, the paradigm of resurrection and eternity is a far better paradigm to approach this than simply waiting for a miracle. Oh, I think it, 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 it yeah, it's the risk, it runs the risk of being presumptuous. Uh, I think that's the reason why Jesus refused to jump off the temple. Because there's, there's a difference, I think there's a difference, it's a good point, there's a difference between faith and presumption. This strikes me as being somewhat presumptuous. When God has given us technology and God has promised us, you know, full healing on the other side of eternity. Now some people, I don't hear this a lot anymore, but some people talk about suffering being redemptive. I think we need to nuance that a lot more carefully because if, if we were going to be consistent with that, then none of us should ever go to doctors, right, or dentists. And we should say, in essence, bring it on. Cause it. Cause it, yeah. But no, nobody lives that way. And I, and I think what we mean, what the scripture means when it talks about this idea is that it's suffering that's unavoidable that's redemptive. And in most cases, it's suffering for your faith that's redemptive. But I think nowhere does the scripture suggest that you enter into avoidable suffering because of the virtue that it produces. I would call that foolishness not faith. In addition, if I've read the New Testament correctly, it seems to me that the redemptive value is largely for earthly life. Because again, if I read the New Testament correctly, when we meet the Lord face to face, we will be fully redeemed. And there will, be, you know, there will be no character issues to address in eternity, thankfully, right? Which suggests that, the, that trials refining our character is predominantly a this-worldly phenomenon. I think you can make the case that there are some people who are so close to death that it's it's pretty hard to see how their suffering has much redemptive value. And in any case, even, even conceding that it has all this redemptive value, I'm not, I'm not sure that gives family members the privilege or the right of authorizing suffering for someone else for their benefit. Now, if you want to go down that road yourself, 
I'd say, knock yourself out. But I don't think that that gives any family member, even conceding all that, it doesn't give a family member the right to impose that on someone, on their loved one. Right? Questions? You want to raise questions on this? Yes. Uh, back to the feeding tube point. Uh, suppose there's no insurance available, finances available. Do the hospitals uh, tend to push families and patients who are comatose to make a decision to pull the plug? Because they're basically, could be they're indefinitely eating up a bed, you know, taking up resources from the hospital. In, in, you can maybe speak to this too. In my experience, generally not. Um, they will, I, I know they will, they will push to get people out of the ICU who don't meet the criteria, but in some cases, in, I say in my experience, in more cases than not, that's because they want the bed freed up for someone else who needs it, not because they want to save the money. I'm not behind the scenes much with hospitals, but especially the Catholic hospitals I've been involved with, I think they're, they're pretty good about not pressuring that. You got a different experience with that? Yeah, I, I sense there's a change as quick a decision towards it. And that's why I'm very afraid of the state health programs, because there's a lot of financial decision could also be because of secular rule. Yeah, now I think there is, there's probably still, I think, a distinction you can make between profitable feudal treatment and unprofitable feudal treatment. Because depending on how a person's insured, uh, you know, you, you can have, I mean, it's not as common as it used to be, but Sometimes you will continue to treat because it does bring in revenue. Now, for pray for a person that's on Medicare, which pays, you know, a fraction of what the cost is, then uh, that that's different. But I know there are most hospitals. I think have line items in their budget for uncompensated care. That you know comes from treating the uninsured or treating immigrants who are in the country illegally or, you know, ER treatment that they never get reimbursed for. Uh, but there are limits to that. And so, you know, there always, there's always good reason to look to, to minimize that. Um, I think where, where I see a lot of that pressure is n not to prolong, you know, expensive stays. Uh, so they may, you know, they may push the physicians more quickly to make the call about a prognosis or about futility than they might have done 10 years ago. Again, I think that's, that's something that the medic, I mean, the hospitals and medical centers have to manage that themselves. Or I think the, the state will eventually step in to manage that. Because you know, I mean, Medicare is, is unsustainable, and something's going to have to change. And I think the easy one of the one of the one of the most or one of the one of the, one of the places that you will see expenses cut is in treating people who are kind of at the margins, uh, and they're and they're. There's treatments that are marginally effective. Uh, anything else you want to add to that? Well, I think mean, right now, ultimately, we still be trying to go with the family's decision. And I think it is true that, you know, that we, have, we see a lot of patients in ICU that are going on, continue. But then I think sometimes they lump it all together. They don't take the time. And see so yeah, it may, they may not be rushing the removal of treatment, but they, I think that point's well taken. They, 
they are tending to rush the prognosis. And that, I think, I think once the prognosis is established, that, that, may, that may be more challenging in some places to backtrack from that than in others. What are um, the legal rights of like a hospital per se to, can a hospital ever refuse care at a certain point when the doctors deem like, like a vegetable stay or something like that? Or is it all completely up, like legally up to the well, Un, un, technically, under the law, if you want to look this up, this is uh, this was this law was passed in, in July of 2000. It's a, uh, Assembly Bill 891. Spent lots of lots of time talking to ethics committees about this. This is California. Right? California passed a law that protects physicians from liability. If they, if they say no to families who are making inappropriate requests for aggressive treatment. Okay. Now, certain conditions have to be met before they can do that. What it doesn't protect them from is being sued. And you correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think for most physicians, Whether they, whether they prevail or not in a lawsuit is far less relevant than staying out of one in the first place. And so what we, what we found is that the law as it's written has not been of much help because you know, pa patients can sue physicians for just about anything, just about any time. Uh, and so the notion that they that the the patient and the family won't prevail, you know, is not you know is not exactly a, a, a load of encouragement to physicians. So I think in most cases that gen, that that is, that is still true that they will if push comes to shove they will do what the family wants, even though the physician may know that the treatment's futile or even harmful to the patient. Right? Now, what they, what, what they can do is they can, turn, they can turn over the care of this patient to another physician, uh, but they can't, right now, they, you can't just sort of walk away and abandon your patient. Um, are insurance companies locked into, like they can't cancel policies once they get to that state or anything? Uh, well, not, not now they can't. Used to be that they could, but not, not now. I mean, that's one of the provisions of Obamacare that lifted the, the lifetime caps on insurance policies. Um, so anyway, the, the point of this was that physicians, families, and hospitals have when they're, they're, we're on our own for navigating these conflicts at the end of life. And these happen all the time. I mean, families want to keep going. Physicians who think the wisest thing is to stop or transition to hospice, I mean, this happens all the time. Um, in fact, I, I had one physician tell me one time, he said that if the patient tells me to stop, which, if the patient does that, they're legally obligated to do that. But if the patient tells me to stop, but the family tells me to keep going, I'm going to keep going. Because, you can see where this is going, yeah. Yeah. the patient's going to die and the family will still be alive to sue me. Now, I, I think that, that's probably a little over the top when it comes to fear of being sued. But that, that fear is very real. And you had, a, you had an action against you? No. you, you nobody's, nobody's attempted to sue you? No, but that's always a defense. You're very, you're very fortunate. That's always a defensive position. Yeah. I mean, the other, the other uh, difficulties, even if they have a durable power attorney, they'd be assigned someone on a level of advanced to 
and they have a durable power attorney, they may change that. Right. And yeah, which you're not, family members are not supposed to do that. Uh, that's why I say that, that, that being the, having the power of attorney for those decisions is not an interpretive function. The design is to enforce the terms of that advanced directive. Uh, but sometimes, I mean, that's not uncommon that family members think they know better. And to put, they'll put huge pressure on physicians to do something different than what the written advance directive outlines. Okay, uh, any other questions on this? Okay, so please have a living will or advance directive. Uh, yes. So the state of California offers a form you can fill out. Do you mm -hmm. need to have that notarized? I don't believe so, but I do believe it has to be witnessed by a non-family member. Okay. And is that just really, really basic about life support? Or? No, it's fairly detailed. It has a lot of options. Probably not all the ones you'd want to include, so but, else that you would recommend? but I'd recommend talking, uh, talking that over with your personal physician. You know, when you go for your annual physical or something like that, which you do, you do do that, don't you? <laughs> Moving right along, that's, that's, that's too convicting. Um, or, you know, estate lawyers do this too. And some, some estate lawyers are very well trained to do this too. So, um, okay. but it's more important actually just to communicate with someone, you know, about what your wishes are. Now, do, I mean, at your age, I would suggest updating your advanced directive periodically, too. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, to let it sit for 20 years, uh, probably not a good idea. So it does need, I mean, just like a will, it needs updating periodically because, you know, your life changes. Uh, okay. But ultimately, I think what, 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 we, what we need to work at is facing death with the perspective that it's a conquered enemy. I can't tell you how many times I've had believing families who, again, I've been tempted to say, you know, but, but don't, I've been tempted to say, do, do you really believe what you say you believe about resurrection and eternity? Because with the way you're hanging on to earthly life, it doesn't look that way to me. And, you know, you, I mean, you'd never know that we are, as the scripture calls it, strangers and aliens and, you know, just passing through. Uh, now, that's not to say that losses of loved ones aren't deeply felt. Uh, but sometimes I think we approach the end of life as though this is our final home. And the, I think the ability to to recognize that we have a glorious homecoming awaiting us. It's a, that's a big part of the positive vision for death and dying that, you know, that, that I think is, is so relevant and so real um, and provides this sort of alternative vision for what, for what death and dying can be. And this is, in my view, this is what, what I think is so tragic about Kevorkian and assisted suicide is that Kevorkian, I think, is robbing people of that experience of, of families ushering their loved ones into their homecoming. And ultimately, that's, I mean, that's why that should be done at home, if at all possible. I mean, it's, you know, after, you know, you know I guess the goal, really the goal, my dad's final hospital stay, the goal was simply to get him home. And once, once we set that as the goal, then we stopped a lot of things. Uh, and that was, and I think that was the appropriate goal, was to just get home. Uh, yes? <clears throat> 
correct my thinking um, if, if needed here. It seems to me that a guiding principle here, not, not the guiding principle necessarily, but certainly a guiding principle in life, end of life decisions is motive. It is, is the motive of the one, uh, either the one who is dying or the family of the, the one who's dying, is the motive to uh, prolong life uh, selfishly or is it an altru In other words, if you're 35 years old, you're diagnosed, diagnosed with cancer or some, some dreaded disease, and you've got a wife and children or a husband and children, or whatever, and uh, the intent there is, look, I'm going to fight this thing, you know, tooth and nail, because my intent or my desire, my motive, is that I want to provide for my children, I want to protect my wife, and so on and so forth. Or is the motive, I just have to live up, because I, I, I'm living in this fear of death. Uh, you know, I guess, it, Looking at this through a biblical lens, through a Christian perspective or framework, it seems to me that motive is is really really key here in making these decisions. Is that? Mm -hmm. No, I think you're headed in the right direction on that. I think that I think you can also say that about st stopping treatments too. Um, my, I, th I think I, th I think this is a fair statement. I never asked him about it, but I think my my dad's greatest fear of all of the stuff he went through was that the cost of these treatments would wipe my mom out financially. And I think if he, if he had known, now they, they, I mean, they were well insured and so the money really wasn't an issue, but I think if he had known that, you know, this, the last round of treatment or the sur I mean the sur less round of surgery I I'm sure was you know five five weeks in the hospital and eleven hours of surgery. I, I mean that wouldn't that wouldn't surprise me if that were you know a million dollars uh, of cost. It's a tertiary care cancer center uh, you know it it wasn't I, I, I know it wasn't cheap. Um, but if, if he, if, if, uh, I'm sure that he would have foregone treatments that would have wiped out my mom financially. And that, I think that can be another motive that, that I'm not persuaded is altogether a bad thing. Because if you, I mean, if you think about it, we, families function differently when serious illness strikes than, than they do ordinarily, right? I mean, I'm, I got, I've got teenagers. I'm trying desperately to teach, to beat the narcissism out of them <laughs> and to teach them that the way a family functions is that we weigh the interest of individual members against the, well, the interest of the family as a whole. And it's always a balance. You know, I, I'm, I mean, I'm like a broken record when I tell my kids, you know, you're not the only one here. But, but it seems to me when serious illness strikes, that model of family goes out the window. Now, to be sure, the person with a serious illness, because of their vulnerability, their interest ought to be weighted more heavily than normal. But it's not clear to me that their interests ought to be the trump card automatically. And I think there, I think there are times when the costs to the family are so significant that it would be a virtuous thing for the person to stop treatments because it's wiping out the family. Now, I think those have to be pretty stark and pretty serious to be the case. And I would never say that they're obligated to do that. That's too strong because once you're obligated, once you say that, then the family members now have a claim on the, the, the serious little person that they can exercise which I think having, having a claim like that is inconsistent with having the right to life for the, for the patient. 
But I, I do think there are times when the treatments for a loved one impose crushing burdens on the family. And I, th I think in, tho in those cases, I think it's, it's okay for the patient to say stop because of what it's going to do to the family. And I think those are pretty narrow. I mean, I think in most, most family members actually uh, willingly take on the burdens of care. But I, I, my guess is that, that most, if not all of us, who are married and have children would stop treatments, even if it would allow us to live longer, if, those treat, if the cost of those treatments would wipe out our families. I could, I could be wrong about that, but I suspect we would, even in ser <clears throat> serious illness, we would weight the well-being of our fam, fut uh, the future well-being of our families more heavily than our own. Uh, I, you know, I was just thinking, you know, suicide isn't always suicide, meaning that if I take my own life for selfish reasons, uh, that's clearly defined as suicide and is clearly seen as sinful. But if I'm taking, if I'm throwing my, if I'm a soldier and I throw myself on a grenade to protect my, my fellow comrades, uh, you know, one would hardly judge that person as having done something immoral. In fact, we would, we would see something, you know, greater love has no limits right. as, as life was friends. Um, so in thinking of, again, of end-of-life decisions, uh, that, you know, if, if, if ending treatments um, is, is going to spare my wife and children of enormous debt, uh, um, I see altruism in that, and I see a godly biblical, you know, uh, right. value right. there. But I suppose that has to be weighed out, too. Yeah, are my wife and children better off with me alive? In other words, are the treatments potentially going to give me of course. An extended and, life? And right. And obviously, right. Yeah. And so, but that's a part of that. All I'm suggesting here is that the, the weighting of burdens and benefits not be real narrowly restricted to just the burden and benefit medically on the patient, yes. which is typically how we do that. Now, again, I, I would never use the language of obligation for that. Um, how should we face end-of-life decisions when, say, the patient is not a believer? Would it be different? Sli oh, I'd say only slightly. Okay. Let's assume, assume here that your, you know, your dad is he's not conscious. Okay. Uh, and he's terminally ill, sort of imminently dying, and you want to keep him on life support so that you can have another, you know, one final opportunity to tell him about Jesus, right? Okay. I, I, actually, I think that's okay to do that. But at, in the same breath, I would say, get to it. <laughs> you know, get on with it. And even if he's not conscious, okay, I'd hold his hand, give it to him as straight as I know how, and you know, ask him to respond by squeezing your hand, you know, something like that. And then you trust, you trust God with the rest and then do what you think is medically appropriate. But I do think I, I would give some slack to that. Okay? And obviously, if they're going to recover, you know, or if they're going to, you know, if they can be restored to a level of functioning that they think is, you know, meaningful for them, then of course you, you treat and you go. But the, you know, there, there are more options than just the full court press and assisted suicide. I mean, there's a lot of in between that involves removing stopping different treatments that are short of assisting suicide also. And so, but, but you know, the, the unbeliever stage is in that 
you know, in the middle of that continuum. Yeah. It's interesting how other ailments, instead of immediate facing of death or end of death, like Alzheimer's, um, how, how family decisions along the way can produce any of the or, or yeah, produce solutions along the way because of the way the family partakes and we just had to make a decision to take my father off of his uh, Alzheimer's meds as opposed to his pain medication and his mood medication. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was based on, it was not based on finance as the ultimate as far as my father was concerned because they are very expensive. But it was based on his faith and what are we doing and keeping him from by keeping him where, where he is at. It was just an amazing family building, family bonding, uh, uh, you know, blessing. Right. But, but it was one of those hard blessings. Yeah. Those, those uh, right. interesting yeah. dynamics. Now, the, yeah, the, the, the tricky part of that is, you know, if, if the person's got, you know, considerable time of productive life, ahead of them and is still refusing treatments. That's when it gets tricky. And that's, and that's where I'd say that not, not every request that you have to honor legally is morally justified. You guys remember uh, Art Buckwald? Yeah. The, the column, columnist, humorist? He was diagnosed with uh, basically congestive heart failure. And they estimated that he had probably, you know, two, three, four years to live. Uh, but that would be, that, that is if they did, you know, open heart surgery and, you know, did what they could to, you know, help prolong his life. But he, refu he refused open heart surgery from the very beginning. I guess he had seen, you know, what that road looks like and just re he refused the surgery and basically refused to treat it and lived, in his view at least, lived considerably better but considerably shorter, too. What do you think of that decision? He was what? Late 70s, early 80s? How would you deal with him if that was your patient? And, uh, well, I guess the lot point of this practice we look at is the functional status. And obviously the prognosis. And ultimately the patient's decision to balance it those yeah. two. We just kind of guide it through the mm -hmm. balance it. But but I, I suspect you, I could be wrong, but I suspect you have patients who are, you know, functioning okay, who are also Ref, you know, they want to stop dialysis. Those I usually try to push them to. You try to talk them out of that? No, I try to talk them into it because it has good quality of life. Yeah, that's what I mean. Talk, try to talk them out of stopping it. Right. Yeah. So, so usually I guide them, you know, because a lot of them are very afraid of dialysis. They get yeah. pictures of the symptoms of death. I said, you know, we have people who can, who can live, who can maintain the same function that you have yes. now for the most part. Yeah. And so I try to guide them, push them toward the treatment. If I, you know, whereas if someone who's 85 and uh, demented, then I try to give them the option that you know you don't have to go through. Yeah. yeah, but and if they if they, you know, if they if they let's say they refuse to even start it. Um, would you would you say that's an immoral decision, or they're doing something that's a wrong decision they're making? Granted, you have, legally you have to respect that. Well, I, I view it as the freedom of choice, just like oh, yeah. to yeah. refuse to accept God. Right, but that do, yeah, that doesn't mean that all all choices are are moral. Right from their so. standpoint, yeah, from my standpoint, it's nothing. You'd say that's a problem. I would do my best to. Yeah. God. And I and I think that's right. I think that's right to try and persuade them. Uh, into being treated. Yeah. The, the Buckwall's decision troubles me a bit. 
Uh, and you, the other place you see this is you see, I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, AIDS patients will refuse treatment at the very, kind of at the very beginning when they start declining because they know it's, you know, it's predictable. Um, but that, those are, I think, those are the ones that are, are really complicated. The other, the other stuff that I think is really complicated today are people who are sort of like what you were in stages of Alzheimer's or people who are severe dementia who are somewhat with the program. They're conscious, but they're also requesting that feeding tubes be removed. That, those are hard ones because when they're, when they're alert and conscious and still you know, have, want, want that removed, then that's a little different story. Well, it's not defining, I mean, getting a definition on who's, uh, whether it's their choice or not. Well, yeah, and, and, and true. I think what, well, though what's legally competent and well, but there there are there are people who are legally incompetent, who are quite capable of making their own decisions, right? I mean, yeah. because I mean, to be legally incompetent, you're either in, you're unconscious, or you're heavy, or you're sedated, or you're in severe pain. You know, one of those three, or it's an emergency. Uh, but, you know, well, we've had, I mean, we've had, is that my phone ringing? Sorry. Um, that's my son wondering when I'm coming home to take him to lunch. Um, <laughs> but I think that we, we, had a, we had a case, uh, this was a few years ago, where the person was pretty severely compromised neurologically. But he was making, you know, he was able to, you know, follow movements around the room. He was he would he could respond with facial expressions to commands, uh, and the family member he was he was on full, you know, full feeding tubes. The family was insistent on having all feeding tubes removed. The family also pro prohibited us from giving him water, water by mouth, and we said we're sorry, that's inhumane. We're not going to do that. Um, but we finally, the social worker was the one who pulled this off. We wrote, we wrote, I had two big sheets of paper, you know, that were blank, but this size in big block letters, we wrote yes and then no on another one. And we actually went to the person and, you know, held up the, the paper and asked them the questions and they would just reach up and grab the paper for yes or no. Mm -hmm. And we asked a number of questions, you know, that were innocuous that were about the weather and, you know, do you know you're in the hospital, those kinds of things. Yeah. Things that you'd ask somebody if after they've had a concussion. Um, and then we asked, do you want to be fed through a tube? And, you know, with some effort, they reached up and grabbed the no sign. And then we repeat, we came back about five minutes later and repeated the whole drill, but had the signs reversed. Asked him a number of questions, and you know, again, he grabbed the no sign. Now, I don't think that person would have passed the legal test for competence. But the physician, the nurses, and the social worker were all satisfied that he had expressed his wishes. Uh, and, you know, and the family, you know, the family, we were allowed the family in the room sort of on the outskirts just to watch. Uh, but it was, it was really interesting to, to see. And the, I mean, basically the nurses who were there said, okay, that's, you know, that's good enough. Um, and lots of patients with dementia, you know, they'll have, you know, their lucidity kind of goes, you know, it comes and goes. And they have, you know, they have loopy periods, but they have lucid periods too. Um, and so, anyway, I'm not sure, just because someone's legally incompetent, declared that, 
I'm not sure I would stop trying to ascertain their wishes. Okay. Any other questions on that before we before we leave that? Let me anything? okay. Let me just say a, a couple things about euthanasia and assisted suicide. This is covered pretty well in, in moral choices uh, in the text. Um, but mainly the, the two, these top two arguments, st still in the popular discussion of assisted suicide and euthanasia, I'm going to treat those as interchangeable for this discussion, though they're clearly not the same thing. Um, the, the, the way the, the academic discussion and the popular discussion have diverged. And what's the, the, the most compelling argument for the culture is a little different than what's considered to be the most compelling argument for the professionals and the bioethics and the, the academic community. Okay. The, the most effective still 30 second soundbite argument for assisted suicide and euthanasia is the mercy argument. And it's sometimes couched as uh, in terms of putting down animals. You know, we do this, you know, we do this for our dogs. You know, why shouldn't we also do this for human beings? Uh, which would be actually be an argument for euthanasia, not for assisted suicide which is kind of an important distinction to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, sometimes even something like the golden rule is invoked, uh, where you know, the suggestion is, well, if, 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 you, if, you, if, if your only options are you know, assisted suicide or facing the end of life in interminable suffering, the assumption is that choice would be obvious, and therefore, if that choice is obvious, you know, how can you be consistent with your own religious notion of the golden rule and deny that option to somebody else by how you're trying to change the law? Okay. Now, I think in, in the, the case of animals, I think is a little bit, that response is a little bit different, because that does, clearly that doesn't justify assisted suicide. The, the mercy argument, though it is very powerful as a 30-second soundbite, is not really compelling to the academic or the professional communities because they, they know that in the vast majority of cases, now there are some that are actually pretty challenging, but in the vast majority of cases, a person's pain at the end of life can be adequately controlled. Okay. Not, not, I'm not saying alleviated, but adequately controlled. Okay. Now, the caveat to that is that the, the access to first-rate pain management does vary along a continuum. Not everybody has access to that. Okay. But, the, but I think I think it's fair to say that medicine has the capacity to control virtually all, not all, not everyone's, because there are, I mean, there are some really challenging scenarios, like end-stage bone cancer, for example, is a, is a, what my understanding is a really difficult or challenging pain management scenario. But for most, most dying patients, their pain can be adequately controlled, okay? which basically essentially takes the mercy argument off the table. And that's why you don't hear any longer in the initiatives that are being passed, they no longer have a condition in them that mandates that assisted suicide is acceptable only in cases of unalleviated pain. Okay. Now, 
I, to, be, to be clear about this, I think the degree of pain management that exists is also on a continuum. Because there's, or, there, I mean, on the one hand, there's ordinary meds for pain. But then I think there's some people's pain requires that they, t they have a level of medication that renders them unconscious. And that's the, the idea of can you, can you sleep before you die, I think is acceptable. Uh, and then there's, I think there's, a, there's a, another level of pain medication where it actually slows the person's heartbeat and respiration. And though it doesn't kill the patient, it may actually hasten their death. I think that's generally okay. Though I've, I've heard recently to the contrary that the need for that is virtually no more. I haven't verified that, but... And then I think there's euthanasia and assisted suicide, which is off the table because that's the place where you have caused the patient's death. Okay. Now, the, 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 ar the argument that, I th that carries the most weight today in, in the more academic discussion of this is the second one, the autonomy argument. It's based on this notion, some people will say it's based on the notion of having a right to die, which the courts have not recognized. Right? But the idea behind it is that, as a general rule, we have the freedom to make life's most personal and private decisions that are the most value-laden decisions apart from government being involved. We have the abortion decisions premised on that. Decisions about contraception, about marriage, about child rearing. Life's most value-laden decisions. This is why the Amish can allow their kids to drop out of school. Uh, you know, those value-laden decisions we tend to make allow people to make without government looking over their shoulder or passing a law. Right? And if it's couched in the idea of having a right to die, then that I think makes it even more potentially persuasive. Now the difficulty with the idea of having a right to die, I think we, we should be clear that the courts have not recognized that, but it's very, a very insightful uh, a very insightful dissenting opinion from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. If you wondered if anything good can come out of the Ninth <laughs> Circuit Court of Appeals, it actually can. One of the justices there, John Noonan, is a Roman Catholic and has written probably the most widely reproduced article defending uh, the right to life. You know, that, that his almost absolute value in history. It's in, it's in every bioethics anthology. Uh, anyway, he sits on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which always gives me pause when you're tempted to bash that court. But in the, in the, in the Supreme Court decisions on assisted suicide from the late 90s, Justice Noonan was one of the dissenters from the Ninth Circuit Court and he made a really compelling point. And basically, I'll paraphrase this, where he said, if, if the legality, if the permissibility of assisted suicide is grounded in a constitutionally protected right to die, then it can't be limited to the terminally ill. In fact, as he put it, I think he put it in something like these terms, that the uh, that the person who has been left at the altar and is so despondent they want to take their life has just as much right to assistance as the elderly person with a terminal illness. Right? If they're competent and adults. 
And I think he's right about that. And that, that and if it's, if it's grounded in a right to die, the only limits that you can put on it have to do with decision-making capability and your status as an adult. Okay. Now, the other, the other side to this, typically, typically in our culture, we put limits on the exercise of people's freedom when that exercise brings a tangible harm to someone else or some other party. Okay. This is where some of the data from Europe is so helpful for us because what seems clear so far in the places in Europe where euthanasia and assisted suicide are legal is that the, the trend from voluntary to non-voluntary either assistance or euthanasia is a very difficult one to stop. Right? That what, what starts out as something purely voluntary invariably moves toward a practice that it is, is at least partially done non-voluntarily. Okay. It seems to me here's how this might work. I mean, let's say that you are our elderly father and, you know, God forbid you have a terrible terminal illness and our, you know, one, two, three, four, your children uh, really don't want to see you go through all the end of life stuff. Uh, we don't want to be burdened, though we wouldn't tell you that. We don't want to be burdened with caring for you. Uh, and we really don't want to see your sizable financial estate uh, go down a rat hole of useless medical treatment. Right. So what we would do, and we may even enlist your physician to be in cahoots with us, is to, we would sort of, you know, we do it a lot, lot more sophisticated way than we're doing in the next two minutes. But we would sort of slowly and over time persuade you to sign this euthanasia declaration. And you would give in eventually because we've twisted your arm. Okay? Not so much because you're tired of living, but because we are tired of your living. Okay? Now, however we do this, is not really the point. The point is, who will ever know mm. that we have coerced you into signing this declaration? I mean, for all, for all the law would know, we could hold a gun to your head or, do, or, give, or put some other threat on you and we could threaten to abandon you if you don't do this, that we won't care for you. And you would do this because you felt coerced. Now, under the law, had, had, had uh, the initiative passed in California in the 90s, we would all be guilty of a felony. And we would go to jail for that on the assumption that it's even detectable. But it seems to me, without, without intolerable invasions of privacy, who, who will know? And especially your physician can actually report the cause of death as being respiratory failure. In fact, I mean, you, you can write the death certificate and obscure the fact that euthanasia has been performed. It's actually not, you know, that, that, had, that it's well documented that that's taking place in Europe in order to avoid inquiries. We actually, we had a case, I won't name the hospital, but everybody in the room knew that euthanasia had been performed. The patient had not complained of pain. The family member was insistent on giving high levels of pain medication far beyond what was necessary to, to relieve pain. And the decision we were facing was whether or not to report this to the coroner's office, which we eventually did. Uh, and the coroner was less than encouraging when they reported back that we have too many of these cases to track them down individually. Um, all while this is still off the table, technically, in terms of the law. So 
I, I mean, well, I mean, I was involved in a consultation of somebody who was administered euthanasia both without their consent and without their knowledge. Right. Now, rough, statistically, roughly 15% of the cases of euthanasia in the parts of Europe where it's legalized are done without consent. Now, in Oregon and in Washington, which is legal, we haven't had that same issue, to be fair. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of literature out about the follow-up for what's going on in Oregon. It seems in Oregon to be managed fairly well. But so far in Oregon, only a handful of people have taken advantage of the law. Hardly anybody is interested in, in utilizing the law because the pain management is so well done. So not quite sure what to make so far of the situation in Oregon, Washington, those, you know, it's still only, it's only been going for less than a decade, so it's a little hard to say what the final analysis will look like on that. But anyway, that's how, you know, if Kevorkian were still on the scene. And if you, if you haven't seen, have you seen the movie, you know, about him? Uh, you don't know Jack? Al Pacino. Al Pacino plays Kevorkian. Um, it's, it's, it's worth seeing. Definitely worth seeing. All right, question? Yes, and then we'll. there at least been attempts at legislation in some of the states that doctors must uh, discuss as an, a treatment option suicide? I thought I have seen something on a political realm that there's been attempts at having that legislation. Well, that would, be part, that would be a part of informing patients about what their options are, right. but only in states where it's legal. Most, most states, in the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision, passed laws to make assisted suicide illegal. And euthanasia is illegal in every state. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm sure you can maintain a big moral difference between assisted suicide and euthanasia. Right. Uh, I think the same arguments apply. 